Dr. Martin Luther King wherever he's spoken. Uh, so when you talk about walking with Dr. King, he has done that and more. And so please give a warm welcome to our keynote speaker this afternoon for Dr. Maurice Woodard.
Walking with Dr. King, I want to challenge us. Can you repeat after me? Check up from the neck up. <laughs> That's what we want to do, that we might be inspired to look at our own selves, because until I can look at myself and see myself as an expression of God, I'm going to miss out on seeing the God in you. Until I can let my light shine, I'm going to miss your light. And it doesn't matter how we say we want to walk. That's talking it. Walking it requires moving your feet. So I'm going to ask this question as a thought. Are you walking with Dr. King or are you standing on clay feet? And now let me lay a foundation real quick. In the second chapter of the book of Daniel, you find that there was a king who had a dream. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar couldn't get his dream together because he kept seeing this image and didn't know what it meant. Daniel was the only person in all of the land that could tell him about his dream. In his dream, he saw an image that had a gold head. And that image also had a breastplate of silver. And the image had bronze thighs. But the problem with the image was it was standing on clay feet. And he didn't understand it until Daniel told him. That was the prophetic, esoteric message about his nation. Then I'm going to lay a second foundation passage of scripture that's found in the recordings of uh, Matthew, an eyewitness to the works of Jesus Christ. Jesus was teaching them one day, and he exegeted something from an Old Testament scripture in Leviticus to make something plain for them to understand. He said in the Old Testament scripture, you have heard what was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father. And he went on to say, and then by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Well, it'd be kind of hard to walk with Dr. King and not be his disciple, wouldn't it? Yeah. All right. For African-American Christian communities around the country, the life and the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. represent a human archetype of the radical gospel of love that Jesus exemplified in his life. Considered the formative figure in the modern fight for civil rights, Dr. King's prophetic voice as a modern revolutionary was a voice that reverberated with the sacred call of our Constitution, and you know what that is, liberty and justice for all. At the core of his message was the belief in the creation of a beloved community, a community of all human persons committed to an ethic of love and an infinitely redemptive love that would be inclusive of friend and foe. Are you walking with Dr. King? Are you standing on play feet? Does your ability to love include friend and foe? Check up from the neck up. <laughs> well, let me roll it down the streets where you are, because I don't want everybody, I don't want nobody to leave here feeling uneasy. If it gets kind of hard and you get kind of quiet, I'm going to say attitude check. <laughs> now, when I say attitude check, I want you to respond by saying, I got it. Let's try that. Attitude check. I got, I got it. it. All right, so y'all get required. That's where we're going to go. Now, on his birthday, millions of Christians from every walk of life and every corner of the world do what? They pause to celebrate a love ethic that's grounded in the Gospels of Jesus. Well, for those who haven't read that, throughout the gospel narrative, Jesus prophetically trumpets a message that tells us to access life, to access liberty, and to access the pursuit of happiness. You have to find a new commandment, and that commandment is to love one another. So on this day, as we pause to celebrate and honor Dr. King, and the labor of love that was his life, perhaps we should do what? Be found examining the tenets of his first love. And if you know anything else about him, you should know the first love of Dr. King was the gospel of Jesus Christ. So much so that he devoted his life to those principles and made it his calling. So my brothers and sisters, the celebration of Dr. King's life then becomes both necessary for two reasons. One, corrective to the exclusion and misrepresentation of blacks in American history, and secondly, to affirm an affirmation of black life that blacks can then pass on from one generation to the next. Why? Because a tree without roots is dead. Attitude check. Uh, okay, so contrary to the time
timeline of many of the 19th and 20th century textbooks, black history is much more than a shallow overview of the conditions of slavery or the emancipation of enslaved Africans in the Americas. Yet African and American contributions to history have often been denied, they've been denored, ignored, devaluated, and purposely hidden in some instances as they've been attributed to other people. So the need to reverse historical miseducation and to set the record straight on the historical, cultural, scientific, political, and social achievements of ethnic Africa and African American people have been the main thrust behind the celebration of black history, which comes next month. And in general, Dr. King's life and what it meant. So as we pause in the midst of daily realities to reflect and meditate on cultural, theological, and political importances in living the dream, in reaching for the dream, and then creating that beloved community that cost Dr. King his life, our minds should turn to some of the things that Dr. King did that should show us what it means to learn how to move beyond our comfort zone. First of all, Dr. King took lessons from Mahatma Gandhi on nonviolence. He was not too Christian to understand that other people who have different beliefs have something to say to us that we can pick up on. Attitude check. I got it. Huh? Uh, uh, he understood uh, the things that the Buddhists speak of when they talk about dependent arising. For not only did Dr. King understand that and Buddha understood it, Jesus Christ understood those same teachings. In other words, every action of everyone that you associate with affects your actions and the actions of all those that you associate with. My words today will affect every one of you. And you all collectively affecting each other will affect everyone that you go out and share anything that you experience today with. That's what this life is all about on this planet. And so not only did Dr. King see that, not only did Christ see that, not only did the Buddha see that, does not the Native Americans say we are all relatives? Come on, somebody, talk to me. Attitude check. <laughs> so it's time for us to stop being so compartmentalized in our comfort zones and to be able to embrace cultures that are beyond ours. You know, I, I laugh when people look at me not knowing that I do own a horse and they see me dressed like a cowboy with a cowboy hat, a black man living in Oregon. And they assume that he's trying to dress like a cowboy. <laughs> and they don't own horses. But we need to stop assuming and start embracing those things that are different because fear and doubt are the enemies of faith and understanding. And until we remove the fear by embracing the unknown joyfully and gleefully, how do you do that? If you're going to walk with Dr. King, you have to let your light so shine before men and women and boys and girls and everyone you come in contact with that they won't see you, but they'll see your good works and glorify source energy. Glorify the fact that you, like them, are a creation and an expression of God. Think about what he did. The whole universe was made without a hammer and a nail. In the mind of a deity or a creator. According to Christian tenets, he spoke it into existence. But if he didn't speak and he just thought it, he made you in his image, he made you in his likeness. What have you created by your thoughts? Most of the drama that you've suffered? Attitude check. I got it. All right. <laughs> So as we create this beloved community, and I'm going to move to a close, the world where, look at the world we live in. You have materialistic terrorism. You have depressed markets on every nation. You have racial, gender, and orientational injustice that persists. So if we want to have an annual observance on Sundays of Dr. King, we must consistently hold together the belief that our characteristic differences are what underpins this beloved vortex that we live in called Rogue Valley. Do you realize if all the flowers in the garden look the same, you wouldn't see any beauty? That's right. That's right. Huh? That's right. God has placed us all here that this area might glorify him by what we become as we embrace one another, as we learn from our differences, as we coalesce. See, when you're spending all your time and all your life competitive, competitive, trying to be number one, you don't care about who's number two or number three, as long as you're number one. That's competition. And as long as you're in competition, you miss out on the bountiful blessings that come when we learn cooperation. Yeah. Yeah. Attitude 
vacuum check? I got it. Well, this beloved community can be created if we take the time to realize lessons past. Eschatology is a futuristic looking at the prophetic. And Dr. King said eschatology was for all time. So when he looked at Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he saw something different. He saw a present day society with a gold head. That's the wealth of our country, the greatest country on the world. Could you look at this, this statue with me again as we go back to that first scripture? Nebuchadnezzar has a nation with a gold head. We have riches. Uh, breastplates have always been for defense and war. So we have a military industrial complex. That's all of our silver. And then we have our education, our culture, our churches, and all those things that matter most that we push down the furthest and get to last, like our schools and education for our children. <laughs> if we're going to walk with Dr. King, we have to move from clay feet to reprioritize what's really important in our civilization. At the onset of our text, the greatest teacher is responding to the heroic law that I shared with you in Leviticus about loving your neighbor as yourself. But see, embedded in this understanding, Israel made two fatal mistakes in the interpretation, both of which continue today. Let me explain that. The two mistakes that they made, the first one is the belief that the title of neighbor is only applied to everybody that looks like me. See, when I lived in Chicago, I never worried about people from the north side coming on the south side, breaking in my car and stealing my radio. If my radio got stolen, it was one of my heavy brothers that were giving me that. So sometimes we have to understand that neighbor has a broader sense than who looks like me, who's situated in my community, my religion, my nation. The word neighbor was used exclusive of other people. Remember, the Samaritans couldn't associate with the Jews. Some people were considered unclean. And we still carry that today in some of our communities where we see others as different and we love our neighbor that looks like us and we hate our enemy or at least despise them subconsciously. So Israel both literally and theologically degraded interactions with any other humans that were not Jews. Hello? And that left them to think that it meant hate the others. Well, otherness theoretically is the process by which dominant individuals, cultural societies, groups, institutions, and social frameworks exclude people whom they deem by dominant groups to have subordinate, inappropriately fitted elements in the society. In other words, it's not even about second class citizenship. You don't have a right for citizenship because you are other. In this context, otherness is rooted in the definition of difference, and it's typically what makes and marks biological involuntary elements of people. For example, we can't help our <coughs> sex or our race. We didn't choose those. And when people judge you on them, that's a real unfair playing field because that's something you have no choice in, how we come into this world. Otherness is a behavioral quality by which we distinguish the familiar from the unfamiliar subconsciously satisfying and leveling individuals, groups, and cultures which father justifies our attempts to oppose those that don't look like us and allows us to think we are right no matter what. How often do we just not even hear people because we assume we already know what they're thinking because of how they look, how they dress, how they're behaving? All they're asking for is a glass of water. And we don't have the time to hear the cry for help because we're judging them on how they're dressed or what they don't have. In this context that we begin to see then what Jesus addressed in his words, you've heard it said, in other words, it's been said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Jesus acknowledges that Hebrew people have another responsibility and have to be cultivated by the act of, I call it theological socialization. In other words, to adopt the rejection of others and then conversely learn acceptance and sameness because you have to love yourself. When you learn to love yourself, it becomes easy to love others. Most people who can't love others really don't love themselves. Paul looked at it this way when he said, oh, wretched man that I am. He, Paul tried to get us to understand, our biggest problem is we all are having this struggle with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in me. Hello. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> our biggest problem is first person 
person singular. And when I can love myself, what people have to say about me, how they look at me, how they prejudge me, I don't have to go around telling about where I went to school or what I have or don't have, because none of that matters. All that matters is that we are source energy. We're only here for a short time. We're going to tell the story and we're going to lay a foundation. And as I'm standing here right now, I'm standing on the backs of others who stood before me. And I didn't take the time, because time would not permit, to lay down the events and the happenings on the bridges and all the songs they were singing and who was killed. Because we don't need to keep singing them same old stories. Do you realize with the same tongue you bless, with the same tongue you curse? And as long as you talk about how I, I was poor forever, I stayed poor for a long time crying that same song. But when I moved here, I moved to a higher understanding of the fact that my own blessings are controlled by me. I don't have to worry about what church I attend to be blessed. An ever-present God, source, whatever you want to call him is more than able to meet you at your point of needs wherever he finds you in need. So ultimately, good of another person above the good of oneself needs to be articulated only in the sense of learning how to love yourself and not judging others based on who you think you are. Your ego will make you think you're just the greatest thing on the planet. <laughs> but if you learn the scriptural passage to that own self be true and realize that it's me it's me standing in the need of prayer. Then you can really get to that passage that is what we call the golden rule, do unto others. See, nowadays we say do unto others, they would do unto you, but do it first. <laughs> no, it takes a different kind of love to just come up with people nowadays. You know, how many of us are really short tempered with everything that's going on? We found ourselves just losing it. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I mean, my temper is short for people, and I try to be loving. I try to be example. Moving right along, though, no. behind Dr. King's concept of the beloved community is Jesus' assertion to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is an idea that we, as a humanity, are tied together in one single garment and caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. This was a way of affirming the reality that made up the structures that form the interrelated whole, or in other words, human beings are dependent on each other. And whenever a person is or possesses what he owes to others who have preceded him, as Dr. King wrote, he said this, whether we realize it or not, each of us live eternally in the rain. We owe somebody. Recognition of one's indebtedness to the past generation should inhibit the sense of self-sufficiency and promote an awareness that personal growth cannot take place apart from meaningful relationships with other persons, that the I cannot obtain fulfillment without the thou. So, having said that, again, are you walking with Dr. Key? Amen. Or are you standing on clay feet? And if you're standing on clay feet, then I'm going to say like Dr. King would have said. He would have said it like this. He would have said, walk together, children. Don't you get weary. The road may be tough and the going may get rough, but walk on. Your friends might leave you. People might not understand you, but walk on. You might be left behind. You might be lying on, but walk on. And at the end, you'll hear them say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now, take rest with the reward that's given to all just and faithful servants. Keep on walking, y'all. Thank you.